So, who do you follow? <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think I even mentioned to you your little cards that you guys dropped on the ground. As a fact, I see one in the aisle there and stuff. They fall out of the programs, and they're designed to fall out so that you'll give them away, not just stick them in your Bible or stick them in your bulletin and then forget about them. But there's somebody in your sphere of influence, in your family, in your neighborhood, where you work, that needs to hear the message of Easter and what happened, what happened at Easter and uh, the, the hope that Easter brings. So again, that's why we gave you these. We'll give you a couple more next week and hopefully you can find somebody. And uh, even if you have to kind of apologize saying, I know you don't want to come, but here, you know, or something and <laughs> m maybe God will say, well, yeah, you need to go there and yeah, you can mention free coffee or popcorn or whatever if you want to, but I mean, the message that we're going to share on Easter Sunday morning uh, is transforming. It could change somebody's life. So um, I hope you'll take the opportunity to invite somebody. Have you all got your insert? It'll follow the leader insert. You can follow along, fill in the blanks if you want to do that. I know many of you do that. So if you want to take that, that would be great. We've been in this series of um, uh, What's Your Problem? for a, a number of weeks now. Have you figured out your problem yet? Anybody figured out their problem? Have you figured out the problem of your, the person next to you? Have you figured out their problem yet? Because there are many problems that we experience in this life. Um, last week we talked about how we, we really all need to make a declaration of dependence, not independence, but a declaration of dependence on God. Because as James, Jesus' little brother, said, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And after all, even our national motto reminds us that, can you say it with me? In Really? Is that really true? In God, we trust, but don't say it out loud. Somebody might be offended if they don't believe in God. But it is our national motto. It's written on our money to remind us every time you pull out a nickel or a penny or a coin or a dollar, it's a reminder that it's in God that we trust. Today, uh, Jesus is going to challenge us to follow his lead, follow the leader. We call the, the message this morning. If we're going to trust God with the lives that he's given to us, we have to choose to follow Jesus. So, so what does that look like? And again, some of you, the example that has been lived in front of you, perhaps at times is not very great. In fact, some of you quit coming to church altogether because you saw some people who said they were Christians, who said they followed Jesus, but boy, some of the some of the shenanigans they pulled or some of the things they said just didn't, didn't you know, weigh in w well with you. And you left church for a while, and now perhaps you're back, and maybe today we'll, we'll clarify. What, what does it look like when we follow Jesus? As Jesus was coming to the end of his ministry, uh, he was on his way to Jerusalem. If you can picture he and his 12 guys and then a whole bunch of other people that were following um, and, and Jesus knew that this would be the last time that he would ever enter Jerusalem. Now, he knew that. The, the, the disciples didn't know that. They didn't have a clue what was coming. Does that sound familiar? Jesus knew, but we don't know what's coming, do we, from one day to the next. Well, Jesus would go to Jerusalem, and he knew that once he was there, he would never leave. He was going to be arrested and eventually crucified there. And so as he walked into Jerusalem for the very last time, there were all kinds of things going through his mind. So, so he decides to get his followers up to speed on what is going to happen to him. Now, this was not the first time that he had done this. And, but, but as you read through the, the, the gospel narratives, three times in this last day, this last trip in, he reminds them what's going to happen. Now, 
up until this point, they had been very popular. Whenever they would enter a city, crowds would join them because they wanted to get close to Jesus. They wanted to touch Jesus. They'd heard about all the stuff that Jesus had done. So these guys, uh, when, when, when the crowds couldn't get close to Jesus, the next best thing was to get close to somebody who was close to Jesus. And so these guys were kind of like rock stars at this stage in their lives. And they were eating this up. I mean, people wanted to be around them. Uh, they, they were very popular. And Jesus knew that uh, this chapter in his life would be closing very soon. And so he thought he'd better bring them up to speed. So he begins to tell them what they, were, uh, what, what they needed to expect when they got to Jerusalem. He, he tells them, he says, now, when, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested. I'm, I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be spit on, they'll beat me, and they will kill me. Now, Jesus tells this story very graphically, and you can read it and go, whoa, wow, he just laid it right out there. But they didn't hear a word that he said. They weren't listening. In fact, James and John, right after Jesus tells them what's going to happen to him, James and John call him off to the side and say, hey, hey, Jesus, a little kind of a private conversation. Uh, you know, sorry about all the spitting and mocking and all that beating stuff and everything. But, but when you become the king, can we sit on your right hand and your left hand side? Can we be like number two and number three? It doesn't matter which one. We'll, we'll just take the second highest and third highest uh, authority in your kingdom. We, we want to be in positions of power. Can you make that happen, Jesus? Now, if you pull yourself out of the story just for a second, how insensitive, how ungrateful. He's just told them that he's going to die. He's going to be beat up. And they're going, yeah, 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 well, whatever. We all die. Can I have some of your power and authority? So when the other ten apostles heard what these two guys were asking, you'd think they would have said, hey, come on, back off. You guys are being insensitive, right? I mean, Jesus, he told us he's going to die. You, you guys need to grow up a little bit, right? Oh, no, no. These ten are ticked off. When they heard about what these guys were asking, they said, hey, hey, wait a minute. We're as good as you are. And it says that a argument broke out to who was the greatest. And so here's the 12 apostles of Jesus arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Right after Jesus announces that he's going to be killed. Is that? <laughs> Does that sound familiar at all? We just miss out on what God's doing. You're my, the breath in my lungs, but, but God, you need to do this, and you need to do that. I mean, the very reason that I'm even alive is because of you, God. But if you don't straighten up here and you don't fix this situation, God, don't you know what you're... I need a little authority here, God. You need to... I mean, you know, you and I are like this, right? I mean, you, you and me. The rest of the world, you know, they don't get it, but we, we get it. The ten other, other apostles are saying, we, we've been with Jesus just as much as you had. We are just as uh, uh, liable and, and uh, desiring of these positions as you two are. And they just had a big old argument. And Jesus, you can imagine <clears throat> what, what, what he did. So Jesus basically says, time out. He gives them all a time out. Okay, everybody to your room. <laughs> or in this case, maybe under a tree. Come over here. Come here. We, we need to do a little talking. Did you not hear? Did you not hear? C come here. You know, grab you by the, t you know, that one, one of those kind of things. Are you listening? Are you listening to me? Do you know what's going to happen? And he tells them again what's going to happen to him. He sits them down and explains how his kingdom works again. And he says to them, you know how the rulers of the Gentiles are when they get power, don't you? 
They lord it over other people and force people to serve them and do whatever they want to do. And the disciples are going, yep, we want some of that. Jesus, that's why we're following you, because when we follow you, then people do what we say. We like that. It's power. And Jesus said, not so with you. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. Uh, If that's why you're hanging out with me, then you're hanging out with me for the wrong reasons. They knew that Jesus would be king one day, and when Jesus was king, their understanding of a king would be then they would have power and authority over people. And Jesus, once again, explains to them that's not how his kingdom's going to work. Now, it's fine to want to be in charge. It's okay to be a ruler and have authority. But when that day comes, Jesus is saying, when you actually have authority, don't use it like everybody else uses authority. You may be entitled to certain power because of your position, but, but you remember that you are under authority too. Always have been, always will be, whether you want to admit to it or not. A word that is used to describe people in our generation, in, in our society today, is that word entitled. You heard that word kicked around? Oh, people are entitled to have that. That's what's wrong with the next generation, we say. Maybe it's what's wrong with our generation, too. Let me see if I can describe for you what entitled means, just in case you you don't know. Uh, It's like an Easter egg hunt. Uh, When there's little kids and there's medium-sized kids and there's big kids in an Easter egg hunt. Have you been to an Easter egg hunt? We're going to have one in a couple of weeks we're going to not do it this way, but I'll, just so you know. When, when they say go, shoot the gun off, or whatever they do to say, okay, go get him, um, usually it's the, the big kids that knock down the little kids and fill their pillowcases full of Easter eggs. And by the end of the Easter egg hen, they've got like 12 pounds of Easter eggs, and the little kids are crying. Because just when they went down to reach for an egg, a big kid swooped in and took the egg from him. Got it. I got there first. It's mine. And the poor little kid either got knocked over or didn't know what was happening. He might get an egg. Maybe. So we're going to have separate areas for little kids and big kids. Just so you know, for our extravaganza, we're going to save those little kids. So... Uh, At the end of the Easter egg hunt, the the bigger kids have all the eggs, and the little kids are crying, and the parents of the little kids go to the people who are in charge of the egg hunt, which isn't me, by the way, okay? Um, And these parents go and say, hey, my kids are entitled to some Easter eggs, too. We go to church here. We waited in line. It's not fair. We're going to go find another church. Over an Easter egg hunt. Hello. And entitlement wars get started over Easter egg hunt. Now, maybe you can't relate to that. Maybe it's been a long time since you've been to an Easter egg hunt. Maybe, how about the day after Thanksgiving sale? Uh, some people call it the Black, Black Friday. Maybe it should be called the Black and Blue Friday because people get beat up and run over and 911 gets called. It's just like nuts. And you see pictures, perhaps you're even in on this, where 600 women show up at a department store and there are 25 blouses that you can get really, really cheap. And 600 gals have their faces plastered against the windows waiting for that door to open. And when it opens, they come piling in. And again, somebody gets run over and 25 ladies are just ecstatic. They got this great deal on a blouse. And all the rest of them? ticked. I got here at 4.30. They go to the counter. They go to the checkout stand. I got here and I was in line and and she took mine. It's mine. (laughs) Yeah. 
Now, guys, you, you, you probably can't relate to that, but maybe, maybe it's Walmart who has their 65-inch TVs on sale for $3.98, but there's only 200 of them. And 600 guys show up early, early morning. In fact, a couple of guys spend the night there, bring their sleeping bags there, there all night. So when Walmart opens their doors, we're going to get one of them big old TVs, right? And 200 guys end up happier than I'll get out, getting this TV, really a good deal. And the other three or 400 are madder than anything. I was here all night. And he cheated. He, it's mine. If, if you don't get one, it's not fair. If you get one, you're really excited about it. Entitlement wars. Now, Jesus, if he walked into a situation, can you imagine Jesus w- walking into a situation like that at Walmart or at the department store? Or, or better yet, if Jesus walked in to an Easter egg hunt, wouldn't that be something? And he says, uh, seriously, I rise from the dead and you're hiding Easter eggs. That's, that's, what, that's what we get. We're going to celebrate my resurrection from the dead by having candy and eggs. What, what, way to go. You guys got the message. It's really... <laughs> and then you're arguing and fighting over Easter eggs. What's, what is wrong with you? Don't you know what it's all about? <laughs> and the question Jesus asks us today is not the question... What are you entitled to? We'll, we'll be fighting over that until the day that I die, until we die. Jesus' question is this, and I put it on your insert there. What will you do with what you're entitled to? What are you going to do with what you're entitled to? Because we're all entitled to certain things, but what are we going to do with those things? That's the big question. If we could get this right, it would change society. If we could get this right, it would change the reputation of the church in this world. When people talk about the church, do they say, man, those are the most generous people, the most giving people, the most loving people? I just love church people. I mean, I don't believe everything they believe, but I want my kid to marry one. I want to work for one of them Christians because, I mean, they, they, are, they are people of integrity and they, they say what they mean and mean what they say and now, again, they believe some weird things, some of, some of them. They fight at Easter egg hunts. But other than that, um, they're good people. Now, it, again, if, if you get this right as an individual, it will change your reputation. Jesus modeled this for us in, in, in a most extreme way. J- just hours before he would be arrested, he gathered with his disciples to have their last meal together. It was a Passover supper. If you're familiar with that, the Passover is a Jewish celebration where they remembered when they were slaves in Egypt, way back in the time of Moses, the, the, the tenth plague for the Egyptians were, was the angel of death uh, came through Egypt and struck down all the firstborn of every family that didn't have the blood of a lamb painted on the doorposts. And if you remember the story, you can read it back in Exodus, leading up to their, their exodus from Egypt. God saved the, the people that day, and he set them free from slavery, and they celebrated that every year. It was a Passover supper that they would have every year, very intricate, very specific things that they ate to remind them of how God provided for them. And so this was the time, this was the Passover time. They were going to have this Passover supper together. And so here's what happened, and I put on your insert there. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world. His guys didn't have a clue. John 13, it was just before the Passover festival Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. How did he do that? We'll see. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. 
Jesus knew several things. Jesus knows everything. Did, did you know that? You don't, you don't have to remind him of things. He, he, he already knows. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world. He knew where he was going. He knew where he came from. He even knew about Judas. He knew that Judas betrayed him and he was going to go out and finish the deed that night, and yet he chose to love them to the very end. Note to self, if you are still breathing, you can still be loving. Once you stop breathing, then you can stop loving. Yeah, but he didn't... Once you stop breathing, you'll stop loving others. Jesus also knew something else. Jesus knew he had been given all authority. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knew he had authority over everything. In other words, Jesus was the most important person in that room that night. In fact, Jesus is the most powerful person in the world. So, what do you do when you are the most powerful person in the room? What, what do you do when you know that there is a group of people down the street who are plotting to kill you? What do you do when the guy who is going to betray you um, he, and he's already set it all up, is sitting next to you in the very room having that very memorable Passover supper, and he's sitting right next to you. What do you do with that guy? I know what I'd want to do. What's your next move when you know that you have been entitled by God with all the power in the world? Jesus knew he had all the power, all the authority in the world. And so he did something. What do you do when you're the most powerful person in the room? Well, Jesus took off his rabbinical robe, his robe, his, uh, uh, the robe that gave him the authority or the outward sign of that he was a rabbi, that he was a teacher. And Jesus went from teacher to servant with one, one small move. Verse 4, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, that robe that he had on. He wrapped a towel around his waist after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus became a servant. So when, when Jesus when it became, um, the un disciples understood what Jesus was going to do, many emotions filled the room. Some of the men thought, you know, I should do this, not him. But nobody did it. I mean, this was a menial task. This was like below minimum wage. I'm not going to do that. If Jesus wants to do that, I guess let him. Some thought, you know, we should have planned better. We should have hired someone to do this. This is just embarrassing for Jesus to do this, and washing our stinky feet. I mean, how, how embarrassing. And, and Jesus is going to do this. And at least one man in the room thought, there is no way I'm going to let Jesus do that. I'm just going to sit here with my stinky feet. He's not washing my feet. Do you know what your Savior did the moment he was aware that he had been entitled by God with all power 
and all authority. He could have done anything. He took the form of a servant. But, but Peter didn't understand. Verses 6 and 7, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. You don't understand, Peter. Would you just trust me with this one? Peter questioned what Jesus was doing because he didn't understand. Does that, does that sound familiar? When you don't understand something that God's doing, do you question? So maybe Peter's in good company. He's questioning, what's going on? What are you doing? You don't do that. I mean, you're, I mean, you're the big shot. You don't do little menial stuff. Then he... Jesus asked Peter, and I think he's asking us today, do you understand? Do you understand? I am your example. I'm setting an example for you. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. That's what I'm entitled to. That's what I do. That's, you're right. He didn't say, oh, no, 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 don't call me that. Don't call me Lord. I mean, you know, that's like calling me God. Don't do that. He didn't, he didn't say, don't call me that. He said, no, you, that you rightly so. You call me that because that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Be a servant. Jesus was entitled to be called teacher and Lord. Rightly so. He is the great teacher. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He knows who he is. He also knows that it's best in, on this planet to be a servant, to be a servant of all, and that he wants us to be servants of others also, to follow his example. Do, he says, do what I have done for you. Do what I have done for you. He, he doesn't say... Um, um, you know, believe what I believe for you. He, he, t he doesn't say, ponder what I have pondered for you. He says, do what I've done for you. At any moment, at any place, at any time, when it dawns upon you that you are entitled to something, Jesus has set the example for us. If you ever wonder, what should I do with what I'm entitled to? Jesus set the example. When you're the most powerful person in the room, look for a way to serve other people. I mean, this happened over 2,000 years ago, and we're still talking about Jesus washing dirty feet. How embarrassing. Our Lord washing dirty feet. Surely he wouldn't do that right before he's crucified. I mean, this is the night of his arrest, and he's washing feet. Jesus set the example. If you are a follower of Jesus, these are our marching orders. Look to serve. When you're the most, most powerful person in the room, look to serve. There's a reason that God has entitled you with certain things. Use those for the kingdom of God. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to understand this, right? 
Nobody has to go to seminary or go to school or study. or What does the Greek say? I mean, it's pretty obvious Jesus said to serve even the most menial things. And then he says this, blessings come when we do. And whenever Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, I mean, Jesus, very truly. Now, I'm not kidding you guys, okay? Very truly, this is really, really, okay? I mean, just, are, you, are you paying attention? Are you listening? Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you believe them? No. You will be blessed if you think about them. You will be blessed if you do them. Do them. Not study them. Not preach them. Not applaud when somebody else does them. But do them yourself. So if we want to be blessed by God, we do what Jesus did, even the menial things. Now, all of us have been entitled to certain things. And the reason we're entitled to them, the, the, the entitlement comes so that we can use those entitlements to help other people, to make a difference in this world. Four entitlements, and I know we have more than that, but four that we all have. You have these entitlements. No, number one, you have an entitlement for some time, your time, your spare time, your weekend, your only day to sleep in. You have that time, your time to work, your time to rest, your time to play. We have all been given 24 hours in a day. There ain't no more time. You can sing about eight days a week, but there's only seven. Always has been, always will be. You got all the time there is. It's how we use our time. We're also entitled with possessions. We have certain things. You bought it. You saved for it. Some of you borrowed to get it. <clears throat> um, you, you've got some stuff. You have some possessions that they, are, in fact, you even have a title to them, don't you? You have a title to your car. You have a title to your home. You're entitled. Huh? That's how that works. Um, all of us have some money. Not very much, maybe, but we all have some money. You earn that money. You work hard for it. It never seems like you have enough, but what money you have you're entitled to that. You have it. It's in your wallet. It's in your pocket. Here, give me your money. G give me... What? What? That's my money. I earned it. I, I'm giving you my money. That's why we sit on it, right, guys? So we can throw our hips out of joint and go get hip surgery when we're older with that pocket. And we also have some influence. If you're a parent, you have influence. Doesn't seem like much sometimes, but you have influence. If you're a teacher you have influence. If you're a supervisor, if you're a coach, if you're a neighbor, you have influence over people around you. The more hopeless our world becomes, the more we will stand out like a beacon of hope as we use what we have, what we're entitled to, to serve others. Now, we don't have to. You don't have, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you could just say, Nah, I ain't going to buy that one. I'm not, no. Other people can serve me if, if you want to. But if you're a follower of Jesus, these are our marching orders. If we choose to follow Jesus' example, that's what he's saying. It, you'll be like a, like a light, a, a beacon on a hill. People will go, I, I don't know about you, but I like it. I like there's something about you. You, you do what? Most people don't do. I like that. Jesus said this, for, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus served and he gave. He served and he gave. Serving and giving are the Marks of following Jesus. 
That's what being a Christian is all about, serving and giving, not being entitled and keeping it all to ourselves. Now, right after this Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples, he introduced to them what we know as communion or the Lord's Supper that we're about to take together as a group or you're only invited to because he wanted them to remember what he was doing for them. They couldn't even remember from walking into Jerusalem when he told them that he was going to be killed and, and crucified, that he would come back and be resurrected. They didn't even remember that. All they wanted was power in his kingdom. So he knew their forgetters were working really good, and he knows about your forgetter. And the older I get, the more my forgetter kicks in. I can't remember anything. It seems like it's like, well, if I don't write it down, it's gone. Now, some of you who are younger and brighter and sharper, you can remember everything. It's, you got it all. But some of us, as we get older, we don't remember anything. Well, Jesus knows all about mankind, all about humankind, that we forget things. We forget things walking into Jerusalem. We forget things just going to work each day or just going home. We, we forget. And so he said, I, I want you to do this. I want you, I want, when, you, when you do this communion, when you do, you, you take that, that little piece of bread, that, that's my body that was given for you. So when you take that little piece of bread, if you would just say, God, thank you for giving your body. You died for me. You died so that I could be set free from sin. You died so I could live. Thank you for that. And every time I have this little piece of bread, I'm going to say, thank I remember what you did. And then afterwards, he took the cup and he said, now you take this and you, 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 you take this drink and you, this, this is really my blood that was spilt for you. And without blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. i died for, I paid for your sin. So every time you take that, so we're going to give you a piece of bread and, or have you come and get it. And, and, and then and with our three aisles, it's going to be really fun to watch you guys. I'm just going to let you just kind of fight over which aisle you want to use because we haven't done it with three aisles before. So, so just get up here when you want to, get your piece of bread, get your, your, your little cup of juice, and then go back and sit and just tell God, thank you. Before you take it, if you just, just pause for a second and say, God, thank you. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve? What do you want me to do? Maybe even today, maybe even this week. And just, and just ponder, spend, spend a moment with him. But even prior to that, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to come. We're going to turn on some music. I mean, it'll, it'll be great to just to kind of sing through the, the words if you'd like to do that. But before you come to take communion, would you just take a minute or two like we normally do to kind of reflect and to say to God, God, what do you want me to do? I've heard this before, or maybe I've heard about the washing the feet. I don't, I don't I'm not going to be washing people's feet. How gross, you know, how gross that is. But, but what, what is it that God's calling you to do and before you come take communion be, be sure that that maybe that one thing is settled what am i going to do what am i going to do with what i just heard okay so if you just remain seated until you're ready to come and then the music's going to play and and the music will last for a few minutes so if you want to wait for a minute or two before you come up that would be awesome come and take the elements and then go back to your seat and you just take communion when you're ready, you remember what Jesus did for you. And for those of you who can't get up here, that's okay. We'll serve you right there at your seat. Susan's got her tray that moves around in her hand, so she can bring that, okay? Let me pray, and then I'll invite you to come take communion. Jesus, thank you so much for uh, the example that you set for us, for the love that you expressed uh, to us, for, for the example even that you are giving us now as as you shared with your guys, the guys that had spent three years with you, that, that you were going to Jerusalem and you were going to die for them. You, you were going to be spat upon. You were going to be beat up. And they missed the whole thing. God, we miss the whole thing sometimes too. When, when we get all 
wrapped up in this world and what we're entitled to and fighting for our rights and nobody's going to do that to me and that'll never happen to me again and all of those things that we say. Lord, I, I pray that as we come to this communion table that we would remember what you did for us. Remember the example that you set for us to commit ourselves to being servants like you served us. So Lord, I pray that t today you would help us to remember what you did, to remember you and to follow your example. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So if you just take a minute before you move, we'll turn on the music. Feel free to come in a, in a minute or so, but be sure you ask God that question. What do you, God, what do you want me to do? What's, what's one step I can take to become more like you? Okay, do that, and then you can come and whichever aisle you choose, just don't run over anybody, okay?